I love Dune. I love the books, and I love parts of the David Lynch version. But since Dune Part 2 comes out right now, before I head to the theater, I want to show some appreciation to this film that was so clearly a labor of love for Denis Villeneuve and everyone else involved in bringing Frank Herbert's vision to life on the big screen. Let us count the ways, shall we? Arrakis. It's an unfathomably harsh desert planet orbited by two moons. Like Tatooine, before it was cool. By controlling spice production, they became obscenely rich. I love the main theme they introduce right off the bat. How ecology shapes the people of Arrakis, how that's intertwined with the economy, and how that economy shapes the politics of the Empire. Dave Batista's head grooves. The weaponry is sick. I love how there's an in-universe explanation for why they mostly use knives instead of guns. This shielding technology that reverts us back to hand-to-hand -hand fighting in an otherwise technologically advanced age. I'm usually kind of annoyed by movies getting split into two, but a book with that many ideas in it should take all the time it needs to tell the story. And yeah, I'm gonna be watching all five hours back to back when both parts come out. Timothy Chalamet looks like a 90s kid, no matter what millennium we're in. Highlighting how wet and bluish green everything is on Caladan foreshadows how out of his element Paul will be in the dry yellow brown Arrakis. Give me the water. The sound design when they use the voice is just like, wow, okay, take the water, damn. Paul multitasks by watching a YouTube explainer video while he's reading something else. He's just like us. It's refreshing to get a mainstream franchise that's, if not pro-drug, then at least honest about the trade-offs of drug use. Sure, you can get addicted and it's impossibly expensive, but how else am I gonna steer a giant space egg with my mind, Mom? Oscar Isaac, always a plus. Smile, Gurney. I am smiling. Dune takes itself very seriously. So on one hand, a joke is out of place in an adaptation, but in this context, the joke makes sense. Keeping up appearances and facades is crucial in this world, especially in front of the Emperor's Herald. Human computers, or mentats. I won't get too deep into the lore here, but in 2024, I've really started to sympathize with a culture that decided to smash artificial intelligence and train certain people's brains into being extra good at math instead. The series of looks between the Reverend Mother, Lady Jessica, and Paul would be like six pages of the book. Suffice to say, there's a lot going unspoken. You'll see. You. Sealing the contract and sealing his doom. I see what you did there. Dreams make good stories, but everything important happens when we're awake. I feel like this will come more into play in part two, but the other big theme of Dune that I love is the power of stories and prophecies, how they can be wielded like weapons in the right or wrong hands. You'll still be the only thing I ever needed you to be, my son. A daddy in every sense of the word. Bravo, sir. See how their personal shields block any fast-moving projectiles? So you have to kill slow and close, making deception and feints the most important attributes to have. A perfect fit for this world. You've never met Harkonnens before I have. They're not human, they're brutal! Good foreshadowing of the bad guys here. If a badass like Gurney Halleck is talking them up as brutal, we'll be extra intimidated when we meet them. Sad that I have to point this out as something I love these days, but they're actually in a real room here, not a green screen studio. Paul sticking his hand into the box and grunting with a woman while his mom cries outside has some Oedipus connotations I'm not fully ready to look into, but it makes this uncomfortable scene extra uncomfortable. Props for working the most famous lines from Dune into the film in a natural, non-clunky way. Have you dreamt of her before? A teenage boy who has recurring dreams of hooking up with Zendaya. That tracks. The path has been laid. Let's hope he doesn't squander it. Again, something the books and hopefully part two go into more, but I love how the Bene Gesserit use myth and legend strategically, how they seed them across the galaxy to be exploited for power. We've been carefully crossing bloodlines to bring forth the one. Sure, she's doing eugenics, but her heart is in the right place. What parent doesn't want their kid to succeed at being an omnipotent god king? Drink it in, folks. That's the last water you'll be seeing for a long time. Bagpipes are cool in small doses. Is that where the Chad vs. Virgin meme comes from? The Thopters, what an awesome ship. They're familiar, but alien, and the bug-like wings make for some great sound design. Another great design, the hunter-seeker assassin drone, like the world's worst mosquito. Plus the way they introduce it, they don't tell us the rules of how it works, they show us. Baron Harkonnen's long snuggie, where evil meets comfort. I shall suck at the abundance of the seas and the treasure hid in the sand. You want a badass who's also solemnly poetic? You call Thanos, uh, Josh Brolin. I love how in a universe with guys named like Thufir Hawat, Liet Kynes, and Duke Leto Atreides, there's also a bro named Duncan Idaho. Well done. Guess Hannah Montana was taken. Hold. <clears throat> Thank you, Stilgar. 
Again, the jokes in this not only make sense in context, but are used to deepen our understanding of how this new character in their culture operates. All this resource gathering and military tech would make for a great real-time strategy game. Oh wait, it did, in 1992. You know what changing the gender of Liet Kynes from the book does to the story? Nothing. In fact, this character has multiple identities and loyalties, depending on the POV you're reading, and personifies the uneasy union of Imperial science and Fremen prophecy. Change in fluidity is in the character's nature. That dive, though. You never forget your first hit. Look at this shot. I mean, just amazing visually. Also, we're over an hour in, and they're still just teasing us with the concept of the giant sandworms. We are still just getting glimpses. But also, giant effing sandworms! It's like Tremors, before it was cool. Timmy and Zendaya are so cute together. If it weren't for Tom, it'd have to be Tim, right? It's confusing. Yeah, but that's why we love it. This planet is awesome. It's like the Hunger Games all day, every day, and only the toughest soldiers make it out alive, where they're given power and prestige in the Imperial Sardaukar army. It's like Warhammer 40k before it was cool. I love throat singing, in small doses. So yeah, they had to cut this whole subplot from the book where the Harkonnens want to sow distrust among the Atreides to throw them off the scent of the traitor in their midst, and try to make Duke Leto suspect Lady Jessica is plotting against him. Leto sniffs this out, but acts as if Jessica's a traitor to draw out the real traitor. Uh, yeah, we're already getting too complicated for most people new to this franchise, so let's just have a moment where he questions her loyalties outright. Simpler that way. Will you protect our son? With my life. Who was the traitor? You were. Me? No. You it. Look at how that little bomb slows itself down to penetrate the shield. In the book, the Sardaukar are disguised as Harkonnen soldiers, but here they're in their regular uniforms. Good change. This scene was chaotic enough already. With the shields down, the real guns can come out. Those cluster bombs would be gorgeous if they weren't, you know, slaughtering our hero's friends and family. You want some of this? No? Thought so. The voice. It's like the Jedi mind trick before it was... You get the idea. Their old life is in ruins, while their future, their only path forward, comes into focus. The desert. Damn. Good for you, Oscar. Your son is dead. Your concubine is dead. Crying a single tear without moving another muscle of your face. Acting! The Baron is a close talker. Gross. And it will almost be his downfall. Hans Zimmer went nuts on this one. <laughs> the Baron crouched against the ceiling, making little choking noises. It's just like everything he does is disturbing. And like the Atreides say, inhuman. It's perfect. Paul gets these visions of leading an army that conquers the known universe in his name. And he gets this vision at his lowest point, the moment when he and the audience are most hungry for revenge. It's a glimmer of both hope and revulsion in the future that awaits. A war in my name! And still, he's just a teenage boy who just lost his father and needs a hug from his mom. Sweat and tears. Mmm, salty. Desert Mouse! Even in this harsh environment, cuteness survives. We've already been on Arrakis for so long, it's genuinely shocking to see the color green almost two hours into the film. Frank Herbert was a true coffee head. He could imagine wild, far-flung societies of technological and mental prowess, but he couldn't imagine a world without coffee, even if it's 50% spit. This shot of the Sardaukar falling like soundless rain against a black background, nice. A lot of good cape work in this film, too. That's the other coolest weapon system in the universe, lasers. As you can see, they're very dangerous and very hard to control. Duncan coming back to life, foreshadowing? Hopefully. The desert claims anyone with good rhythm. Careful, you're gonna create an entire society of Elaines. Spade on Getty Prime looks nice. Squeeze hard. Yes, uncle. Contrast the Baron instructing his nephew to squeeze them while in the scene before, Paul was being instructed to let go. Props to Lady Jessica for crossing the desert while pregnant, having lost the love of her life without complaint. Look at the textured, inward-facing fangs of the worm. It's just so alien and horrifying, but hypnotic. Truly the last place I'd want to stick my hand, but something about it compels me to reach inside and grab some popcorn. Just when you thought she wasn't really going to be in this movie, boom, surprise Zendaya. The Atreides salute is an all-time great movie gesture. Is he toying with him? This is such an awesome way to create stakes for an otherwise overpowered protagonist. Yes, he can beat his enemy at any time, but he's not willing to yet. My road leads into the desert. This is as good a place as any to end part one. Paul accepting his destiny, fulfilling the prophecy, but still wary of the consequences. And what a staggering work of imagination by Frank Herbert, and incredible craftsmanship by Denis Villeneuve. I love this franchise so much, and best of all, unlike Game of Thrones or the continuing stumbles of Harry Potter, this story has already been told. It's just up to us to decide whether it'll come to life on the screen, and I for one hope it does, because this story only gets weirder from here. 
and I love it. Well, those are my top 76 reasons to love Dune. Can we get to 100 or beyond? Sound off in the comments below with what you love about the franchise, and if we stay on the golden path, we'll see you back here for even more reasons after Dune Part 2 is released into the universe.